Welcome. Welcome to a session, a conversation on Nagorno-Karabakh. My name is Celeste Wallander. I am privileged to uh, serve as moderator for this uh, panel. And thank you for the assistance from the audience in my, in my duties. Um, I um, am going to uh, start by inviting um, our esteemed guests to offer some initial thoughts on the challenges and opportunities each sees uh, in the challenge of resolving uh, the dispute over Nagorno-Karabakh. And then we will have time for some questions uh, and some further discussion. Um, uh, our guests today are President Ilham Aliyev of Azerbaijan and Prime Minister Nikol, Nikol Pashinyan of Armenia. Um, the two leaders are at the heart of something that the Munich Security Conference has always sought to speak to and to help advance, which is the peaceful resolution of disputes in the international system. And I'm really grateful to Chairman Ischinger for making sure that the, this issue uh, it remains on the agenda and in the attention of the Munich Security Conference. With that, let me turn to President Aliyev and invite him to offer his thoughts on the challenges and opportunities. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to express gratitude to Chairman Ischinger for uh, organizing this event. I told Mr. Ischinger just uh, now that uh, there was an opportunity to deliver the messages from Armenian and Azerbaijani leadership several years ago in Davos and the predecessor of Mr. Pashinyan uh, was supposed to attend, but last moment he canceled his participation. Uh, so I'm glad that finally we get to the point so we'll be able to deliver the messages and to answer the questions which I think will be uh, enough today. So first of all, on the resolution, in order to mm, talk about how to resolve the conflict, first we need to go back and to look to the history of the issue. Nagorno-Karabakh uh, is part of Azerbaijan. This is historical truth, and this is uh, based on the international law norms. And uh, territorial integrity of Azerbaijan is recognized by the whole world, and Nagorno-Karabakh is an uh, integrated part of our country. From historical point of view, back in 1805, the Khan of uh, Karabakh, Ibrahim Khan, signed a treaty with the uh, uh, general of uh, Russian Empire, Tsitsianov. Under this treaty, Karabakh Khanet, Azerbaijani Karabakh Khanet, as an independent uh, country, uh, became under the rule of the Russian Empire. In that treaty, that treaty was called Kurekchai Treaty, the text of this treaty is, is in internet, nothing is said about Armenian population of Karabakh. Uh, other treaties were uh, signed uh, in 1813 and 1828, Gulistan and Turkmenchai. Under these treaties, uh, the rest part of Azerbaijan became part of Russian Empire, and also Dagestan, Georgia, and Armenia also. So this is a historical uh, part of the issue. Then, during the uh, period when Russian Empire collapsed, and uh, Georgian and Azerbaijani Democratic Republic were established, the, one of the first decrees of Azerbaijani Democratic Republic in 1918 was to transfer Yerevan from Azerbaijan to Armenia and to uh, announce it a capital of Armenia. This is also a historical fact. If you give something to someone, that means that this something belonged to you. In 1921, uh, the Caucasus Bureau of the Bolshevik Party made a decision uh, to retain Nagorno-Karabakh within Azerbaijan to retain and not to transfer, as some Armenian historians want to present. This is also a historical fact. And the uh, other historical fact is that in 1923, 
the Azerbaijani Soviet Social Republic issued a decree on creation of Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous District inside Azerbaijan. So this is the history. And then uh, in the end of 80s, Armenia launched an aggression against Azerbaijan. 300,000 Azerbaijanis were deported from the territory of Armenia. And then in the beginning of 90s, Armenia launched aggression already against Azerbaijan Republic. And as a result of that aggression, almost 20% uh, of our territories are under occupation. And one million of Azerbaijanis became refugees and IDPs. Our people were subject of ethnic cleansing. And in 1992, uh, previous uh, Armenian uh, regime committed a war crime, a genocide of Hojali. As a result, 613 innocent civilians, among them 106 women and 63 children, were brutally killed. More than 10 countries recognized Nagorno-Karabakh as independent country. Coming to the international law issue, once again, Nagorno-Karabakh is part of Azerbaijan. United Nations Security Council adopted four resolutions demanding withdrawal of Armenian troops from the occupied territories. These resolutions are not resolved. Therefore, any solution which uh, will be achieved as a result of peaceful negotiation must uh, provide uh, preservation of internationally recognized territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. I will now conclude in order not to uh, use more time that it was planned. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for that overview. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, um, I think we are ready to hear okay. your, your views on this issue. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, I would ask President Aliyev not to go so far into history because when uh, Armenian king Tigran the Great was negotiating with, uh, with uh, Pompey, a Roman, uh, Roman uh, um, uh, military leader, there wasn't any country in the South Caucasus in all around the world uh, named Azerbaijan. And so I don't think it is right way to go so far because I can, I, I could go even further and start from, for example, 400, uh, be, uh, 400 year before Christ. But I wouldn't do that because I don't think it is right way to go. As far as um, Nagorno-Karabakh is concerned as a, uh, like a country, you know, I should uh, say that I'm not agree with uh, uh, President Aliyev because uh, Caucasian Bureau decided to uh, uh, Karabakh to be a part of Azerbaijan, uh, Armenia, I'm sorry. And after that decision, and this was totally lawful decision, and after that, in person, uh, according to the personal initiative of Iosif Stalin, this decision was changed in the Moscow, and it was like a, um, like a uh, plot between Stalin, Lenin, and Ataturk. And Karabakh never been a part of in the independent state of Azerbaijan. And he, uh, Karabakh was put, was put um, uh, into Azerbaijan only in the process of forming Soviet Union. And when we, uh, we are speaking on the territorial integrity, we should decide about which country, territorial integrity we are speaking. My question is, if Azerbaijan respected territorial in integrity of Soviet Union, becoming independent country, as Azerbaijan left 
Soviet Union, in the same way, Nagorno-Karabakh left Soviet Union. You can say that I'm now speaking on a country which uh, doesn't exist, meaning uh, Soviet Union. But the Soviet Republic, which contains Nagorno-Karabakh, also doesn't is exist. There is no Soviet Republic, Soviet Socialist Republic of Azerbaijan. And that is true. And like Azerbaijan gained independence from Soviet Union, in the same way, Karabakh gained independence both from Soviet Union and from Soviet Azerbaijan. As far as Khujali is concerned, um, in the mid 90s, former president of Azerbaijan, Ayas Umutalibov, gave an interview to the Russian paper Argumenti e Facti, saying that uh, the provocation in Hojali was organized by Azerbaijani opposition to tackle him from the power. And this happened, actually, because as a result of that event, Ayaz Mutalipov was, uh, was, um, was um, uh, tackled from the, from the uh, post of president of Azerbaijan. About, about the um, uh, UN Security Council um, documents, if we will what was the general meaning of, of, of those documents? The general meaning of those documents was unconditionally and immediately ceasefire to stop any, any violence and stop military actions. And when we will see uh, U.S. Security Council Resolution 884, we will see that they're written that Azerbaijan violated ceasefire and as a result, Azerbaijan lost territories. And first of all, it's Azerbaijan that didn't keep the conditions of the um, Security Council um, document. And it is very important to state. But you know, I don't think it is a good way for Armenian and Azerbaijani leaders every time repeat the same thing. Unfortunately, within the last 25, even 30 years, we are repeating every time, every time, the same things, and I'm afraid international community maybe somehow um, is tired hearing the same thing. And I think that we need to bring some new ideas. And I would like to say that when I became prime minister of Armenia through the uh, nonviolent um, uh, Velvet People's Revolution, I understood that it isn't possible to solve 30 years lasting conflict with one and or two step. And I thought that for solving this problem, we need to have revolutions. And I started the process of micro revolutions and in the next um, opportunity when the floor would come to me, I will, I will, I will present you the role uh, of micro-revolutions in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh negotiation process that I initiated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Before 
We were to, uh, that is a, a welcome um, topic of conversation. I thought as a logical follow-up to the historical uh, um, background that each of you has offered to the group, and as a political scientist, I always want to get on to the solution. I feel like historians are help us understand, but they don't help us always understand how to move forward. Sorry for any historians in the room. Um, what I wanted to get to get your thoughts on, and I'll start with you, Mr. Prime Minister. What if you're here in an international uh, uh, audience, many experienced negotiators, many who have worked on this challenge for some 30 years and trying to support a peaceful resolution of the dispute. What is the one thing you would want to see from the international community to help? you advance what you think is an equitable, peaceful solution to the challenge of Nagorno-Karabakh? And maybe about two minute answer? Yes, I'll, I'll turn to the there president. is a very concrete thing that international community could do. It make it clear that there is no any military solution for Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. There is no any military solution and international community should make it strongly and very clear. If someone thinks otherwise, saying that there is military solution for Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, I guess that people of Nagorno-Karabakh conflict would answer. In that case, we can say that this conflict already sol um, solved. So, but I think we need to sustainable peace and Armenia, and I'm not represent Nagorno-Karabakh in negotiation process, but I know that Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh are ready to put real efforts to create in our region sustainable peace. And as a prime minister of Armenia, I perceive this situation, not only my responsibility, for security of my country, but I understand my responsibility for regional security and for global security. And I invite President Aliyev to perceive this situation as a, our mutual task to create sustainable peace and stability and perceive this situation not only an issue of our national agenda, but also an agenda of global and regional security and our duty and our responsibility to bring our effort, our input to the global security. And I would assure you and, uh, that Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh are ready for that. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Um, those were very helpful, and thank you for sharing your, your priorities with us. President Aliyev, may I ask you the same question? You are very experienced in negotiating this. You've dealt with many people in this room on the issue, but help us understand, what do you think is the most important at this moment in history uh, for the international community to do to help you advance what you think is an equitable and peaceful resolution to the conflict? First of all, I'd like to make one comment. Um, I'm absolutely sure that we came here to tell the truth. And what I said in my introductory remarks is 100% truth, which can be easily checked right now. Just enter the internet, find those documents which I referred to, and you will understand who is telling truth and who is not. Second comment, I'd like also to clarify situation which uh, in Armenia, unfortunately, became a kind of a attempt to, ex for the, uh, to find an excuse of what they've done in Khojali. Uh, President Ayaz Mutalibov, he is in good health and he lives in Baku, maybe Armenian side doesn't know it, recently and many times said that he never said that Khojali genocide was organized by Azerbaijanis. This is, as uh, it is said today, it's a fake news which was invented by some of Armenian journalists in Russia, and uh, that was put in Russian press, but he never said that. And this is absolutely true. What uh, committed the genocide in Hojali, their names are well known. They have been 
local Armenians, Armenians from Armenia, and Armenians from diaspora. And the names of these people are well known, and many books and uh, international articles were published about that. Therefore, to say that Azerbaijanis themselves brutally killed 63 children, 100 women, and 1,000 people are still missing is a peak of cynicism. With respect to what international community should do, I think the most important is that international community, and when we talk about international community, we talk primarily about OEC Minsk Group co-chairs efforts. They should at last <clears throat> very clearly explain to Armenian side that Nagorno-Karabakh is not Armenia, that Nagorno-Karabakh is not independent country. No one recognizes this illegal entity. Uh, so this is number one. The second, I think there should be more international pressure on Armenia in order to implement resolutions of Security Council, because there is no higher international body than Security Council of United Nations. And they adopted four resolutions. It's easy to check. The numbers of these resolutions are known to specialists. What it says, it says Armenian troops should immediately and unconditionally withdraw from the occupied territories. Not only Nagorno-Karabakh is occupied, but seven districts surrounding it. Armenia wants to hide it. Seven districts where Armenians never lived. In the last Soviet census of 1989, the population of Nagorno-Karabakh was identified as 189,000 people out of which 139,000 Armenians, 48,000 Azerbaijanis, and some other representatives of other people. So all Azerbaijanis were ethnically cleansed from Nagorno-Karabakh and from our ancient city of Shusha. Then all Azerbaijanis were ethnically cleansed from seven districts. They committed a genocide against our people, against our culture. They destroyed our mosques. They destroyed our graves. They changed the name of our cities. They now publish the map of Nagorno-Karabakh, which consists of all the occupied territories. And then they say that we should uh, agree with these realities. Therefore, international community should explain first that Nagorno-Karabakh is Azerbaijan, and second, put a serious pressure on aggressor to stop. Prime Minister, just one, one, one minute. Okay. Prime Minister just said about peace. Okay, I agree. But how it correlates with what happened today on the line of contact when Azerbaijani soldier was killed by Armenian sniper? So I think the elements of the challenge are clear to everyone. There is a complicated history, uh, territory uh, that has uh, been part of different political entities over time, the human tragedy of, of refugees and those killed on both sides, a ceasefire that is not uh, held um, for the time, uh, for a period of time enough to create trust and a basis for moving forward on, on a political negotiation. So I'd welcome some questions on some of these issues. May I make several, uh, How about, um, so I want to move to the questions, and, and I'm guessing that the questions will provide the opportunity for following up on several of those issues, if I may, because I do want to, I have my boss sitting right here and I don't want to break the rules. We've got to get to the questions. Um, thank you, sir. Um, yes, the first question um, with uh, help. I have a microphone in the audience, I believe. Yes? And after I created the space for a question, now you're all going to fail me. Is this right? <laughs> Because then I'll just turn back to Mr. Prime Minister. Please, you you can follow up. Okay. 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 I'm oh. gonna. I will come to that question. Yeah, we'll come to that question. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Uh, you know, I, I would like to make uh, several comments. First of all, on resolution of uh, UN Security Council, there is no word Armenian troops. There is written local. Armenian forces. That means that people of Nagorno-Karabakh formed uh, self uh, uh, forces for self-defense, and there is no written Armenian troops about victims. Yes, it is. It is strategy. 
It is conflict. And thousands of people died as a result of that conflict. And both Armenian and Azerbaijanis. And this is fact. But personally me, I read in, in the uh, newspaper, argumenti e facti, the interview of former president of Azerbaijan. And uh, I think we, we, we can uh, find it easily in the internet. On historical facts, there is a book, Nagorno-Karabakh, legal aspect, and what, what I said, you can find it there, and you can find it in the historical books. Names of city and about the uh, ethnic cleans, cleanses. In, in Nagorno-Karabakh was the region of Shaumia. Living, living with Armenian, okay, okay. There is a, there is a Shaumian, let's, uh, my opinion is Nagorno-Karabakh, okay, but, but there is a region, there is a region, Shaumian, Shaumian, and in 1988, there lived 100% population of Armenia, Armenians, and now there is no one Armenian, and the name of Shaumian is changed into the Azerbaijani name, it is a difficult word to me, and uh, President Aliyev said th that today Azerbaijani soldiers, soldier uh, uh, was killed and I can say that today in the border of Gaza, Armenia and Azerbaijan, Armenian soldier uh, was injured by the Azerbaijani snipers. A and this is our mutual task. What to do? Stop this process. Thank you. That's a good a good place to turn over. I am going to give you, Mr. President, the answer to answer, the opportunity to answer the specific uh, points you dis disagree with, and then we do have a questioner, so I don't want to miss that opportunity. Please. Just, just, just comments, because once again, I came here to tell the truth. And once again, I tell. I don't know what was written in Argumenti Facti. Argumenti Facti is a newspaper, it's an independent newspaper where many Armenians work. And we in Azerbaijan know the number of Armenians who run the leading Russian press. So they can write whatever they want. Therefore, I refer to the official statement of the former president of Azerbaijan, Ayaz Mutalibov, who said that he never said that. So now look, the president, the former president, his word, and the word of one pro-Armenian or Armenian journalist, which has more value. This is first thing. About uh, Shaoman. Uh, uh, Mr. Prime Minister was just uh, pointing that it was Stalin who made a decision to give Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan, which is wrong, because, again, look at the Caucasus Bureau, July 1921, when it is said to retain Nagorno-Karabakh in Azerbaijan and not to transfer it to Azerbaijan. But if he doesn't like Stalin so much, it's strange why he likes so much Shaoman, because Shaoman was uh, one of the Bolsheviks, it was a person who killed innocent Azerbaijanis. And today's so-called capital of Nagorno-Karabakh is named after his name. The question, if Nagorno-Karabakh is an ancient Armenian territory, why doesn't it have the ancient Armenian name for the capital? Because the ancient name for the capital is Khan Kandi, the village of the Khan. And the Stepanakert, because Shaoman's name was Stepan. Kert means city, is that right, in Armenia. Stepana Kert was named in the name of that Bolshevik. So that once again proves that there was no Armenian historical legacy on those territories. And coming back to from where I began, this historical issue is important for understanding how the conflict should be resolved. Thank you, sir. Um, I hope everyone's taking notes, because we're getting a history lesson here um, with multiple dimensions. Um, do we, do, we do have a question, please. And if you would uh, identify yourself as you answer so we know with whom we're speaking. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Florian Kriener. I am a research fellow with the Max Planck Institute for International Law. And um, President Aliyev already mentioned the role of international law. My question would be, 
to both, um, would you submit this dispute to the International Court of Justice via special agreement? Mr. President, may I ask you to address the question first? You know, Azerbaijan is committed to the negotiation process, therefore we did not lose hope that by negotiations we will be able to uh, restore our territorial integrity. Therefore, uh, when still we have these hopes, probably that will not be the best choice, but if uh, as a result of the new approach from Armenian side, the negotiations will be completely disrupted, then of course this option can be considered. Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, we also devoted to the negotiation process, peace process, as I said, and I think uh, that uh, negotiation should take place in the format of OEC means group co-chairmanship, and we are working uh, very intensively, and as I said, we are ready to put real efforts uh, to uh, make real difference and to reach to the solution of conflict. But nobody asked me about many revolutions that I've met in negotiation process. I hope I will 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 have will have opportunity. I am asking you to please yeah. explain. Next time, maybe. I'm asking about you to revolutions. I <laughs> mini no, revolutions. That's what I mini want revolutions. to hear. I'm well, asking you, you know, to explain you know, your mini. Uh, you know, my my conceptual perception is that, uh, as I said already, it isn't possible just uh, solve this long-lasting conflict with one two step. We need, why I'm saying micro-revolution, because I think that we need to have micro-revolution conditionally to, to transform it into mini-revolution and after that to have real breakthrough in negotiation process. What was the uh, micro-revolution? In the September of 2018, I announced that any solution of Nagorno-Karabakh conflict should be acceptable for people of Armenia, for people of Karabakh, and for people of Azerbaijan. And why this is micro-revolution? Because I'm first Armenian leader saying that any solution should be acceptable for Azerbaijani people as well. And, uh, but now after, uh, after more than one year after that revolution, I'm not only only leader of Armenia, but I'm only uh, uh, leader Azerbaijan and Armenia that saying that any solution should be acceptable for all sides. It is very important micro revolution. Another revolution, I, um, in, in, in my one of the, during man, uh, one of the, my press conference, I called uh, to uh, users of social media, Azerbaijani and Armenian users of social media, not to use social media to offend each other, to threaten each other, and to insult each other, but use social media, new technologies for, uh, for trying to understand each other better. And, and it is another, another way, and, and uh, I think that we, we should, and uh, I tried to address, um, address directly to the Azerbaijani people, and if uh, President Aliyev don't mind, and I'm, I don't mind that President Aliyev would speak with Armenian people, mm -hmm. but we have very strange fact. President Aliyev is refusing to speak to representatives of Nagorno-Karabakh, and it is very strange fact. How it is possible to solve Nagorno-Karabakh conflict without, sol uh, without uh, speaking with the representatives of Nagorno-Karabakh. So, By the way, Nagorno-Karabakh was recognized as a, uh, a party of conflict and party of negotiation by the OSC, and this, pro this, uh, this, this happened twice in 24 March of 1992, mm -hmm. and in 19, uh, 1994 in Budapest OSC Summit. Thank you. Thank you. So let me ask President Aliyev, what do you think of the three proposed micro-revolutions to, uh, to seek the views of Azerbaijani citizens who've suffered 
from the war, Armenian citizens and the residents of Nagorno-Karabakh, and I assume also the occupied territories you would want to, or in, including refugees from those occupied territories you would want to include, and the idea of social media not being, we've heard about a lot about this today, uh, exacerbating force for hostility among the peoples and the idea of being able to welcome uh, speaking to one another citizens honestly. You know, during my experience of negotiation with Armenian leaders, I uh, had this opportunity with two predecessors of uh, Mr. Pashinyan. Always in the very decisive moment of negotiation, they found some excuse in order not to continue. Otherwise, uh, to, to put it, they, all of them wanted to keep status quo unchanged, but all of them tried to do it differently. Now, uh, when uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan talks about his proposal that the, the resolution must be accepted to the people of Azerbaijan, I answered to that. And I said, what is acceptable to the people of Azerbaijan? People of Azerbaijan, those who suffer from Armenian aggression, want to go to, back to their homes. This is their fundamental right. They're deprived from this right for almost 30 years because Armenian leadership. It is not Nagorno-Karabakh. And when Prime Minister talks about so-called self-defense forces of Nagorno-Karabakh, again he's telling things which is not true. Because he knows very well, and I know, that more than 80% of so-called Nagorno-Karabakh army are citizens of Armenia. And this is true, maybe even more than 80%. Therefore, there is no Nagorno-Karabakh army. There is no Nagorno-Karabakh republic. It's, and there are only two parties to the conflict, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Ask OSC Ms. Rubko chairs, who are the parties to the conflict? They will say the same, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Nagorno-Karabakh is not. Why it is not? It is other question, but it is not, and we are not going to talk to them. We are talking to aggressor. We are ready to talk to Nagorno-Karabakh in case Armenia stops funding this illegal entity, Armenia pulls back all their military troops from Nagorno-Karabakh, and uh, completely withdraws from our territory. And then we will have, you know, arguments to talk to these people. But until they are there, no way. And they want to keep status quo unchanged. They think that they can keep these territories under occupation forever. And I'm sure that uh, that will not be the case. And our territorial integrity must be uh, restored. We had, uh, coming to the second part, we had exchange of journalists recently. And I think that was an experience which we need to evaluate. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to evaluate its positive and negative uh, side because part of society in Armenia and in Azerbaijan was not very supportive to that format. But that was a decision by uh, two leaders to, to try. We mm -hmm. want to try every opportunity to find a peaceful settlement, to persuade Armenian people that they cannot live like that forever. They need to find solution with us and live in the future in peace as uh, neighbors. Well, I appreciate you um, reporting that um, constructive step or that attempt at a constructive attempt because that's the spirit we want to uh, support. Um, may I, uh, we have a time for maybe one more question and some closing remarks. Is there uh, another question um, from the floor? Yes. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Elena Chernenko. I'm a Russian journalist from the Kommersant newspaper and the Munich Young Leader of 2015. Um, uh, Russia is one of the countries that is trying to bring about a solution within the OCE process. Um, and as far as, as, uh, as I understand, one of the proposals was uh, maybe leaving the status question for later and trying to do something that maybe the sides can uh, more eagerly um, agree about, for example, about those districts around Nagorno-Karabakh creating a corridor and other steps. So do you see any chances for an interim solution that would leave the status question for later and resolve maybe some of the other things? Thank you. President Aliyev, do you have uh, thoughts yes, on the question? Uh, yes, I think this is possible and this proposal was seriously considered by Azerbaijan and in general we gave our agreement to that. That's the most reasonable thing to do because it's clear that we need to resolve this conflict in phases. We cannot resolve it one and completely in one day. 
it should be put in phases, and the first phase should be, and as, uh, as the journalist said in the Russian proposal, liberation of uh, part of the occupied territories, return of Azerbaijani IDPs to those territories, resettlement of that territory. Uh, in the meantime, the process of uh, normalization of relations uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and uh, the status of Nagorno-Karabakh to be discussed later when both sides are ready. Because without the process on the ground, without beginning of liberation of the territories, it will be not possible to agree on the status. Our position is that status must not interfere with territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. At the same time, we uh, <coughs> always were saying that Azerbaijan is a multi-confessional and multinational country. There are many national minorities in Azerbaijan who live in peace and dignity. And when our territorial integrity is fully restored, Armenia as na Armenians as national minority will enjoy all the rights and privileges as any other representative of any other nation in our country. Well, thank you, uh, President Liev. Step by step sounds like your own micro revolution, so I like this theme. Um, and by the way, we have uh, uh, one mutual mining revolution. I hope I will uh, have opportunity to tell Please, about you, that. Please, you have the floor. Yeah, yeah. And uh, um, uh, when uh, we first met in um, Dushanbe, in capital of uh, Tajikistan, after that, uh, we, we with um, President Aliyev made a little mining revolution because because after that meeting, the tension um, uh, after that meeting, uh, uh, in general, um, uh, reduced unprecedentedly, and we've been able to create um, direct, uh, direct um, um, uh, line for contact and information. And I should accept that uh, in that case, President Aliyev is co-author with me. As far as uh, territory, uh, uh, President Aliyev is saying uh, territories and uh, from point of view and uh, uh, in perception of Azerbaijan, these are territories, but from point of view of Karabakh, this, this is security, because we need to understand why current status quo, quo emerged. Because when Nagorno-Karabakh tried to use its right to, for self-determination, a military action started against Armenia of Nagorno-Karabakh. And Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh were forced to organize self-defense. President Aliyev uh, uh, was speaking on Shushi, and the capital of uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, Stepanakert, within years was bombed from Shushi, and and uh, and uh, peaceful uh, uh, citizens they are living in underground for many, many, many long, long time, and this is the truth. It isn't, you know, it isn't possible to give up security for anyone and for uh, um, Karabakh as well. President Aliyev mentioned um, uh, military forces of Azerbaijan. My son is passing its military service in Nagorno-Karabakh, but he went there as a, uh, uh, as a uh, voluntarily to, to uh, defend his compatriot because he knows history, what happened in 19, from 1998. And we, I, I already said about the Xiaomian region with 100% of Armenian population, but now there live no one Armenian. And we know the uh, case of Nakhichevan with huge Armenian population, and it is an autonomous republic in the, in the uh, Azerbaijan, and now there is no one Armenian. And uh, one more uh, sentence. President Aliyev is saying that Nagorno-Karabakh isn't a part of negotiation and the conflict. But Azerbaijan twice signed agreement with Nagorno-Karabakh. First, it was 
in, in 1994, and it was ceasefire agreement between Armenia, Nagorno-Karabakh, and Azerbaijan, and ministers of defense signed that, and after three months, in July of 2000, uh, 1994, they confirmed that uh, the ceasefire would be kept until the political resolution of that conflict. So I, um, we are at the end of our session. Um, I think that I would like to express my gratitude to President Aliyev and to Prime Minister uh, Pashinyan for their extraordinary knowledge their extraordinary passion. I think it is clear um, that both of these leaders care very deeply about resolving the conflict, but care very deeply about how the conflict will be resolved. And we cannot um, expect less. I also think in addition to the fact that we heard uh, uh, the full scope of the challenge and the dynamics of the challenge and the elements of the challenge, we also, and I'm grateful to both of you, heard elements of what the opportunities could also be for a way forward in improving um, the lives of those affected by the conflict and maybe through micro steps or micro revolutions beginning a constructive process of finding a peaceful resolution. So we are extraordinarily lucky at this historic uh, opportunity here at the Munich Security Conference. And let us thank, please, President Aliyev and Prime Minister Pashinyan for sharing their thoughts with us. Please. Uh, just, uh, just one remark because that topic, just one th constructive. constructive, yeah, on self-determination only. I will not talk about the fact that in Yerevan 70% of population were Azerbaijanis in the beginning of 19th century. I will not talk about that, that's what I said. <laughs> okay. On self-determination. Uh, that's what they always talk about. Armenian people self-determinated themselves. They have an Armenian state. My advice is to find other places on earth to self-determinate them for the second time, not in Azerbaijan. I have to you know, uh, you know, uh, it was Mr. President, it wasn't so constructive, but I would say in times of the, the grand, the great, whole, 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 in our region, there were only two nations, Armenian and Georgians. And Georgians, there were there were no 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 one. And not only in the times of the Tigran the Great, but in times of Bagratunis, in times of Ar Arshakunis, you 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 could you could find it in any historic book, any historic book. At least they're both laughing. But they're but. Both laughing, right? they're both laughing. But I, I'm very glad for this discussion, and I would like one more time confirm that Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh are ready to put real effort to solving this conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone.